All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to school. All that good stuff. Uh, today, we're going to go over a variety of things, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details of the course in just a moment. But before we get started, I want to do a little experiment. Make some observations on that bottle. What do you see in there? A clear liquid, right? But what happens when I shake it? It becomes blue, right? Well, let's see what happens when it just sits for a second or two while we're talking about it. Formulate a hypothesis for me. What do you think is going on? Why did it turn blue when I shook it? Because you had two um, liquids of um, two clear liquids with different viscosities that when we mix it, you shook them. Okay, that's a possibility. But if I make an observation, I don't see any two liquids with different viscosities. Or at least I can't directly see anything. It looks like it's a homogeneous solution, right? What else? It just took a little bit of energy to like the reaction to stuff. Okay, so maybe shaking it introduced some energy, right? So to test that hypothesis, how could I test that hypothesis? How else could I put energy into the system to see if it was... I could heat it, right? Yeah, so maybe I needed to start off with my bottle and maybe heat it to see if that hypothesis was, in fact, valid. What else could be going on? When you aerated it. Okay, so when I shook it, there's something above that liquid, right? It's not a container full of liquid, and presumably there's some air in there. We don't know that for a fact, but presumably there's some air in there, and so when I shook it, and aerated it, what would be going into the solution? Okay, so it could be oxygen or it could be nitrogen, right? What else is in air? A little carbon dioxide maybe, right? So how could I test that hypothesis? How could I test the hypothesis that it might be one of the components of air that's responsible for this? Okay, so maybe I start off and I take the bottle and I purge it with nitrogen get all the air out and just put, put pure nitrogen in there. And then if I shake the bottle and see the same effect, maybe nitrogen is to blame, right? What else could I do? I could purge it with oxygen, right? Shake it and see if something happened uh, that may give us a hint as to what's going on. Here in just a moment, though, we're going to see that this bottle is going to go colorless again. Uh, and we can regenerate it again by shaking, at least a few times, okay? And so we're going to talk about what's really going on today in this, okay? And so you formulated some interesting hypotheses that we could actually perhaps test to see whether or not these, uh, these various ideas are in fact correct. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But let's, as we go on, kind of keep an eye on the bottle and let me know when it turns, when it turns colorless, okay? So you all are in the honor section of Organic Chemistry 1, Chemistry 255. This is the first part of a uh, two-course sequence. And so today I'm going to introduce to you the course. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we learn. It's one of the important things that you need to get out of college is how to learn and to teach yourself for the rest of your life. And that's one of the things that I hope, oh, look at our bottle. It's now colorless again, right? And so if I come over and I shake it again, it's going to go blue again, okay? And so something's going on there, right? So we're going to talk about how we learn. It's something that we all do, but surprisingly enough, very few of us really understand, myself included, exactly how we learn. I learn differently than the rest of you, okay? You all learn differently from each other. But there are some things that are common in all of our learning experiences, and if we have a better understand of, understanding of how we learn, you will perform better in this class, I promise. We're going to talk a little bit about the syllabus, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction as to why organic chemistry is important. And this is one of the things that I get all the time from students. Why do I need to take this class? I want to be a physician. I'm not going to do organic chemistry on my patients, right? True and false. <laughs> uh, organic chemistry is the chemistry of life. It really is biochemistry in a lot of, in a lot of respects, okay? And so, but also how you learn to think in this class is how a physician thinks about their patients, okay? And so that's very, very important that you have some of these skills that we're going to be learning about today. So before we move on, I want to start off with some uh, introductions. So we'll start here. I'm Gabby. I'm a junior. 
Okay, what's your major? Therapeutic recreation. Okay. I'm Paige. I'm a sophomore, and my major is biology. Okay. I'm Rose. I'm a sophomore, and my major is biochemistry. Okay. <coughs> Sam, I'm a sophomore biology major. Okay. Nick, sophomore chemistry major. Okay. Nathan, sophomore chemistry major. Brianne, sophomore microbiology. Brianne or Brianna? Brianne. Brianne. Okay. I'm Delaney, and I'm a sophomore polar science major. Okay. I'm Katie, and I'm a sophomore chemistry major. I'm Terry, and I'm a sophomore nursing major. Okay. I'm Blaine, and I'm a sophomore marine biology major. Okay. I'm Brian, and I'm a sophomore biochemistry major. Okay. I'm Harrison, and I'm a sophomore polar science and engineering major. Okay. I'm Maggie, I'm a sophomore biology major. Okay. I'm Chance, I'm a sophomore general biology major. Okay. I'm Allison. I am a sophomore microbiology major. I'm Matthew. I'm a sophomore chemistry major. Mm -hmm. I'm Jamie Lou. I'm a sophomore forensic science major. Okay. I'm Russell. I'm a sophomore polymer science major. I'm Sarah. I'm a sophomore polymer science major. Okay. I'm Danny. I'm a junior biology major. Danny? Danny. Yeah. Okay. Danielle. 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 Okay. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I will remember every one of your faces but it will take me a while to learn every one of your names. So if I point at you, I'm not being rude, okay? Uh, just refresh my memory. Uh, some of you I have interacted with a lot more and it's a lot easier for me to remember your name and some of you, I, this is the first time I've met you, okay? And so it will take me a while to learn your name. So if you send me an email or something, just say, you know, I'm in your class. <laughs> uh, something like that so I know uh, kind of right off the bat what's going on and always feel free to stop by and, and talk to me about any any issues that you may have but we'll talk about that here in just a moment uh, one of the first plugs that I want to give you all if you've never learned about this we do have a student success website uh, at the university uh, it's usm.edu forward slash success if you have any questions regarding things at the university this is the first place that I would suggest you go to find out any information that you may need to know you're always welcome to email me, uh, but you know, late at night I may not respond quite quickly. Uh, and so you can always find things that you need uh, on this website. It's not just for chemistry, it's not just for College of Science and Technology. Every college has information on here. So if you're taking a class in the College of Arts and Letters, you can find information about tutorial services that they may have there, help sessions, that kind of thing. So uh, it's a great place to, to go. I would strongly encourage you to bookmark it in your, in your browser. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some class information. All of this is contained within the syllabus that I handed out to you or that you uh, downloaded from uh, Blackboard. Uh, this is what your textbook should look like. Okay. Um, get some information up there. We are using the 11th edition. If you happen to have the 10th edition, that is fine. The only thing is that the problems that I have suggested that you practice out of the book not, will not necessarily be identical. However, that's just for your practice, okay? So I'm not interested in taking those up, but there are a number of problems like that that will be on the inverted lectures that we'll talk about in a little bit, okay? So if you don't have the 11th edition, it's perfectly fine, but you may want to go to the library and check out the 11th edition, just look at those problems or borrow a friend's or something like that. But other than that, the content is essentially the same. They just come out with new editions every so often so they can charge you more. That's really the only thing. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Doug Masterson. I am uh, um, an organic chemist by training. Uh, I've got a research group up here on this floor. If you go down and to the left, um, we're on this floor where the lab on the last on the left going this way. Uh, I'm also the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Affairs, so I have two offices. I have my office up here in 407, which if you just walk out this door, turn to your right, room 407. Uh, if it's open, I'm in there. But I will probably be spending most of my time downstairs in the Dean's office in Tech 103. I have an open door policy regardless of which area I'm in, okay? So if you see my door open and you have something that you need to talk with me about, by all means, please feel free to just come on in and let's have a chat. Okay. Uh, if I happen to be in the middle of something extraordinarily important, I'll just ask you to wait or I'll ask you to make an appointment, but I do have an open door policy. I have two phones, unfortunately. Um, 4714 is my number up here. The dean's office number is 4883. If you call that number, they will just forward to whichever number I'm at. So that's probably the best one for you to, to uh, try to tackle. My office hours will be on Wednesdays. 
from 10 to 11 over in the Tutorial Center. Does everybody know where the Tutorial Center is over in Walker? It's over by Miss Tina's office, right? So I will be there. Uh, however, I am always available anytime up to 10 o'clock at night, okay, for a variety of, of things. And so always feel free to email me, douglas.masterson at usm.edu, and I usually get back with you within an hour or so, unless I'm just extraordinarily busy, okay? And we do have some technologies that I can use to help you through problems by email. So uh, we'll talk more about those at a later time. Any questions about my contact information, where you can find me? Okay. So a model kit is required for the class. If you haven't gotten one already, you can get them over in the bookstore. Uh, the ones in the bookstore are in a uh, cardboard case. It is exactly the same kit that you see here. This is my favorite kit. It's the exact kit that you would buy over in the bookstore, except it comes in a plastic case. And the reason that I like it, it fits nicely into a backpack and doesn't crunch and crumble. Uh, and if you want to get one in a plastic case, you can uh, Google uh, Darling Model Kits. Uh, and there's a website, I think it's dar darlingmodels.com. And you can buy them uh, directly from the manufacturer. I think they're around $20 to $25 now, something like that, if you wanted to just buy one in a hard case. Why would you want to do that? Well, you're going to be in this class for two semesters, right? So you want your model kit to last a long time. And if you're a chemistry or polymer major, you're probably going to take some higher level chemistry courses or polymer courses and need a model kit. So it's a good investment in my opinion. Uh, but it is identical to the kit that's available over in the bookstore. And if you've already bought that one, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the course. Okay, The emphasis in 255 really is the language of organic chemistry. You're going to be learning a foreign language basically this semester. Okay, so how many people have learned a foreign language before in high school? Studied it a little bit, right? A lot of what you are going to find out about organic chemistry is going to be very similar to that experience. You couldn't go and just read the text in Spanish and probably perform well, right? You had to practice it, okay? We're going to talk a lot, an awful lot about that, and it turns out that that's exactly the way organic chemistry works. Are there people who can just read it and immediately perform? Yes. Sure. Is that the vast majority of us? No. Was that me as a student? No. It took me a lot of experience and a lot of uh, practice to get to where I am today. Okay. Uh, we're going to do our very best to cover chapters 1 through 10, and we almost always succeed in that. Sometimes we don't get completely through 10, but we're going we're gonna to be moving at a fairly quick pace. Another reason why medical schools like this is because organic chemistry moves at about the same content pace as what you'll experience in almost all of your classes in medical school if that's where you're, you're heading. Okay, Graded work, we will have three 50-minute exams. We will have a comprehensive final. We will have online homework through sapling. We will have a video project. Uh, and you'll have inverted lectures as a component of the course. Okay, and so those are where you're actually going to come and work in groups. I'm not going to lecture that day. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to help you all do different things. This is a doing class. Okay, and so it's more than just content. It's can you uh, utilize the content effectively. Okay. Now, it does not have to be a difficult subject. Okay. Nice thing is when you all were in Gen Chem, you were studying a lot about the periodic table. We only study a very small part of the periodic table. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and some of the halogens, for the most part. Okay? But that part of the periodic table is very, very powerful. Okay? But if you have good study habits <coughs> and good study skills, you should be in a good position to do well in organic chemistry. But um, a lot of people do find it difficult simply because they don't have the proper study skills and skill sets to come in and tackle this type of a course. Okay, but we'll, we'll work, work on that. Uh, on your syllabus, there is a study tips for chemistry students. And I wish I had written this entire thing. It's several pages in length, as you know. Um, and what I'm going to do, if you read it, sign the front page and turn it in to me uh, on or before August the 24th. I'm going to give you five bonus points right off the bat. Okay, that's five percent of an exam grade. OK? 
okay, for doing this. I think this individual who wrote this, Dr. Labirko, wrote an amazing piece. I wish I had written it, uh, but he wrote it when I was actually a graduate student, not a, not a practicing professor, okay? So I cut just the kind of the, the meat out of it here. So getting good grades in, in chemistry is really based on having good performances on exams and assignments. Everything that you learned about performing well in athletics or music applies to having a good performance in chemistry. How many of you have played sports before or been in the band? Okay. How many of you showed up the day of the concert or the day of the game without having practiced before? None of you. The same thing happens here. How you study, think of that as your practice. Okay? You want to perform well on game day or on concert day, right? That's going to be uh, the exam days. Okay? And so if you practice regularly and you develop a lifestyle that is not getting in the way of your performance, you will do well in this class, I promise. Okay? It, this is not an impossible class regardless of what people frequently say about it. The Birko goes in and talks a num uh, quite a bit about a variety of these areas about writing everything out. Writing is very important to learning. Practice daily. I would say practice regularly. Okay? Get a regular practice schedule for your organic chemistry. Students that have taken this class, not the honors class usually, but taken this particular 255 class um, <coughs> at USM who didn't do as well as they wanted to the first time and then come back again and do really well, and I always ask them, well, what changed? I practiced, I studied, I scheduled it. Those are things that are really, really uh, important. Always do your best work. You never practiced your flute or your cello or football or baseball or whatever your sport was, right? And went out and just did a half-speed job when you were practicing. You tried to practice like you wanted to play, right? So always do your best work, even when you're working on homework. You need to think about the material regularly. You're here for an entire semester, okay? Now, I know you can't think about it all the time. You've got other classes, but you can definitely be thinking about this material outside of class, okay? Learn the material in small chunks. Do not try to do the exam or cram before the exam method, okay? And I know many of you are sitting there going, I've done that before and it works for me, okay? Maybe. But I can guarantee you that in this class, trying to digest the amount of material you're going to get in one two or three hour setting before the exam is nearly impossible. Okay? Study the material in small chunks. That really helps. Concentrate on your work. Concentrate on learning. Don't worry about the grade. The grade will take care of itself. I always get frustrated when I have a student that wants to just worry about their grade. I'm like, well, if you learn the material, the grade takes care of this. Well, no, but what about my grade? I'm trying to diffuse the whole grading thing, okay? Yes, I have to assign you a grade at the end of the semester. One of the things that is not in the syllabus that I'm telling you today that you should write down is at the end of the semester, if you do better on the final than you did on the entire semester's worth of work, I will give you the better grade. Okay, if you can prove to me on the last day that you did you mastered all the material. I'll give you that grade. So it's possible at any point in the semester to get an A, regardless of what your grade is at that point. Okay? The only caveat that I have to that is to be eligible, you have to have completed all your assignments. So you can't just say, well, I know I'm, I'm going to ace this. I'm just going to blow off everything till the final. Okay? So if you've completed everything, you've done your best job, and let's say you had a B going into the final, and you had an A on the final exam, I'll give you the A. I'm fine with that. Okay? So at any point in the semester, it's possible for you to get a better grade than what you currently have. Okay? So I want you to keep that in mind. Always prepare for class. Take an active part in class. We're going to have opportunities for active participation through a variety of, of mechanisms. Make sure you reread the material and study offensively rather than defensively. What do I mean by that? What does it mean to study offensively rather than defensively? Be proactive instead of reactive. Pardon? Be proactive instead of reactive. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Don't study just because he's going to be on the test. Study it because you want to learn about it. That's true, too. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I would much rather you be studying and over-preparing for an exam, nail that exam and be good to go, right, as opposed to at the end having to try to play catch up because, yeah, you could still get an A on the final, but, well, I didn't get a chance to study for that midterm and, you know, I didn't do well on it. And so that's, you know, now you're trying to play catch up and catch up's hard to do, okay? Um, so keep that in mind. How we learn. So I, there's a, a paper in Blackboard that I asked you all to read uh, coming into the, to today. Uh, and it's a nice long paper actually on uh, how we learn. I'm only going to talk briefly about it, uh, but I think it's very important that you think about. So I like the little cartoon strip. I taught Stripe how to whistle. I don't hear him whistling. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it, <laughs> right? We quite frequently think that because I'm up here teaching as faculty, I think, oh, I'm up here teaching, you must be learning. I can teach without any learning occurring, okay? Students also quite frequently think, I read the material, therefore I must be learning. You can read things and not comprehend a word, right? So actions don't necessarily translate into the learning process that we're interested in. Teaching, from my point of view, I'm here to facilitate your learning, but I cannot learn you. Okay, it's very important to understand that. I cannot learn you. You have to learn. But I'm here not to get in the way of that, but to help facilitate that. Okay? And each one of you have unique uh, abilities, unique um, approaches to how we do that. This is Bloom's levels of thinking from the lowest to the highest. Know what, notice what is at the lowest level in Bloom's taxonomy for, for learning. It's knowledge. Many people come to college thinking they're going to get knowledge, right? We don't care about that anymore, largely. You have access to Wikipedia, Google. You have access to more stuff than I ever had access to, and you have it on these little devices right at your fingertips. Why do I care if you remember little bits and pieces of facts? Yeah, you're going to need to memorize some stuff and know some things, and there's no doubt about it, but that's not ultimately what I hope you leave this class with. I hope you leave with being able to comprehend that knowledge. And I hope, certainly, you're able to get to where you can apply that knowledge to other things. Okay? Many of you are, that have a desire to go to medical school, right? How many of you? Right? Quite a few of you. Right? You're not going to do organic chemistry reactions on your patients. But what you learn in doing that in this class will apply to your patients, I promise you. Okay? And it's more than just getting through the MCAT exam. Okay? This is Kolb's learning cycle. This is how learning occurs from his point of view. There's concrete experiences, how we interact with the environment. There are observations, reflective observations, how we watch things. That's what you guys are going to be doing when I'm lecturing, right? But I want you to get some physical experience as well, observations and, and uh, hands-on kind of experiences, and hopefully you're going to be able to do that in the laboratories, right? We're going to do demonstrations throughout the semester, things that illustrate certain points, okay? Hope you'll have some uh, active exper uh, experimentation, of course, in the, in the uh, laboratory sections. What I want you to do, we learn by making mistakes and reflecting on those mistakes. I want you to leave this class with a growth mindset. You are where you're at, and you are all fantastic because, I know that, because you're in the Honors College. You've made a cut, right? You are a part of a group that we know has fantastic academic abilities. But you still have room to grow. You're not here to validate the fact that you're smart. You're here to start from where you're at and move forward and learn something, right? That's a growth mindset. And so we learn by making mistakes. This is what I'm in the business of failure. I go into the lab, I run an experiment, and it fails. Do I get upset about it or do I view it as a learning opportunity? I predicted that that reaction should work, and it didn't. That challenges my view of the world, right? And so we start studying those things. I can't tell you how many times we've published a paper 
from an experiment that we thought would work, and we were just going to use the results of that experiment in something else, and it didn't go as predicted. And then we spent two or three months studying that and got a paper out of it. You know, we thought and we predicted that this would happen, and it didn't. Something new is happening, right? So if you make mistakes, if you don't get the grades that you want on a particular assignment, you need to reflect on that and learn and grow, okay? And so that's part of the reason why I say at the end, you still have the opportunity to get an A. If you've reflected and you've grown and you've gotten to where you can master the material by the date that the provost says I have to have grades entered, I'm fine with that as long as you're uh, growing. So we learn by experience, and I view learning as talent development. Many of you are highly talented. I want you to be more talented when you leave this class. Okay? We all have different levels of talent, but I want everybody to move to a level of higher talent development. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So the class format's pretty, pretty straightforward. We're going to have lecture and class discussions. Uh, today it's pretty much so just a lecture. Uh, we will lecture using PowerPoint. Those will be placed in Blackboard. For those of you who've already accessed Blackboard, you know that there's a number of them there. Keep in mind, though, go back frequently because I'm still updating some of the materials that are in there. So everything for Chapter 1 is as it should be. But beyond that, you might not want to download those quite yet. Okay? We will frequently have concepts tests. Those are not graded. We'll have covered a, a subject. And then I'll just throw up a question, and I'll ask you all to answer it. And then we'll have a discussion about that. We will have inverted lectures where I have expected you to either view a pincast, a video, or just come having read the sections in the book, and I'm not going to lecture. We're going to hand out, I'm going to hand out some problems, and we're all going to get together in groups of two or three, and we're going to work on those problems, and we're going to learn how to solve those types of problems by working together. You will have online homework, and of course, like I mentioned, some pincasts. So I have one of those live scribe pins. Anybody have one of those? They're kind of cool. I can write and talk, and it records everything. And, then you, and when you go view the pencast, it will look like I'm writing, and you'll hear my voice, and you'll be able to fast forward through it. And so it's really one of the technologies that if you email me and said, I'm having a problem with question two, for example, I could actually help you work out to through this pencast and send it to you, and you can view it by, by uh, interactive uh, PDF file. So if you have Adobe Viewer, you can, or one of the newer versions of Adobe uh, reader, excuse me, you can, you can view them. Okay. Class behavior, I usually don't need to go uh, over this too much with you all. Uh, if you arrive late, I don't lock, well, I guess the door was locked this morning, but I usually don't have the door locked. Just come in, take the first available seat. Please keep your electronic devices in silent mode. Never answer a call during a class. Don't Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, Snapchat, whatever else is out there. Uh, okay. Be courteous. All questions should be directed to me unless we're having a class discussion. And if you are overly disruptive, you lose your right to complete and turn any assignments due that day. I've never had to enforce that, thank God. So, course grading. Everybody's always interested in this, right? So the inverted lectures will be worth 150 points in the class. There are going to be 10 of them, one for each chapter, 15 points apiece. It's, probably, uh, it's around 17% of the course content. We'll have three regular exams, somewhere around 25 questions. They'll be worth 300 points total, 100 points apiece, about a third of the class content. Online homework, 200 points, 22% of the class. The video project, 50 points, about 6% of the course content. And then the final exam will be worth 200 points. It will be cumulative, and it'll be worth about 22% of the course content. So the total number of points, of course, is 900. I will offset all exams to the highest score, but I will not do more than 10%. Okay? So let's suppose one of you come in and exam one, the highest exam grade is a 95. Everybody gets five points. Okay, so you'll, you'll see your raw score, and if you made an, uh, an 85, now the five points is added onto that, and you get, you know, your 90. Okay, so that's how that works. But if we come in and your highest exam score for the class is an 80, I only add 10 points. I won't add 20. Okay, so that's how that's going to work. Okay? Question? No. Oh, okay. Note there are no makeup exams 
That does not mean that if you're going to be gone for a university function, I mean, I'll let you take the exam early, of course. I mean, I have to do that. But it's not like I have exam day and then, uh, oh, you slept in and you can have this exam day. We don't do that, okay? So there are no makeup exams. Okay. My grading scale is a little different than most. I believe it should be a challenge to get an A. And I also think you have to work really, really hard to get an F. <laughs> okay? I think it should be fairly straightforward to pass any class. Okay? My grading scale is this, and it is curved, and the curve remains firm. It will not change. To get an A in this class, you have to have 90% or above. I'll take a B down to 77. I'll take a C down to 67, and I'll take a D down to 55. If you can prove to me that you're better than the odds of a coin flip, you'll pass the class. Okay? Below 55% is an F. Okay? I have very, very few D's and F's in this class, okay, especially for the honors. Most of the grades are in the A, B range. It is possible. Okay? Um, again, I believe it, an A should mean something special and an F should mean something special. Okay? Just not both positive. Okay? In your um, syllabus, you have the class schedule. Notice I say that it is subject to change because we just, you never know. We could have a hurricane, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, hoping not, but it's, it's possible. Uh, we could have a day where, for whatever reason, you all had a bunch of questions and I was working problems with you and we just didn't get through the material like I wanted to. And so it's, it's subject to change with one exception. The exam days are the exam days are the exam days unless there's a hurricane, okay? Uh, they are the exam days. So, if for whatever reason we didn't quite make it to chapter 3.8 to 3.15, that's fine, exam one just won't cover it, but we're having exam one on this day, okay? So you know right now when each and every one of our exam days are. So if you have a conflict coming up, you're going on some active learning thing with the psychology department or whatever, let me know so we can work together to get that exam to you on, in a timely fashion. Okay? Any questions? No? Okay. Homework is, is by sapling. You already have chapter one available to you, and it's due August 30th or 31st? 31st. 31st. So I will open these up as we start the chapter. Typically, just typically, the way that this works, the sapling homework will be due the week after, a, I usually give you a full week after we cover that material. Okay, so if we finish chapter one today, you could expect this day next week to be the due date for that. Okay, that's how I do that. Now as we get closer towards the end of the semester, it may get a little more narrow. Okay, but that's typically how I do this. Okay, so go ahead and get signed up on... Uh, Sapling. The course materials are available on Blackboard. Um, this is just an old snippet of what the Blackboard course shell looks like. There's also, if you go into the getting started, there's a link to my YouTube channel. Right now I'm recording my lecture through my phone while I'm doing this presentation. That all will be uploaded to YouTube. You will have access to all of my YouTube videos uh, immediately after the class. Okay, so today I'll run down to my office, I'll try to get that uploaded at some point today, uh, and you'll have access to what we covered today. So if you ever need to, you know, what was it that Dr. Masterson said, you can always go to the YouTube channel, okay? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, chemistry, just a little bit here in terms of uh, employment. People are always interested in what chemists can do. Uh, to make a living. They don't all just have to be professors. Uh, and so this is the most recent uh, data that I have on in, in unemployment numbers for, for chemists. And what you can see is that if you're an, uh, an American Chemical Society member chemist, your unemployment rate is below other college graduates and well below the national population. If you look at when we were in the downturn the economic downturn and unemployment started to rise, notice there's a big gap there. 
Just about every industry that you can think of these days needs to have chemical experience. We use materials. We use things, right? It doesn't matter whether you're in biology and you're doing environmental science. It doesn't matter whether you're in polymer science and you're doing materials. You're going to need some chemistry to, to be successful with this, okay? And so chemists have experienced uh, better than average employment. Uh, and so just something for you to think about if you're thinking about you know, a major or a direction, and, or maybe you're uh, thinking about changing your major, I'd highly recommend you think about changing it to chemistry. So, uh, but I'm biased, so. Research opportunities in this department, we offer a variety of research opportunities for uh, students. If you're interested in perhaps doing some organic chemistry research, uh, make an appointment to talk with me. I can point you in the right direction. Uh, I'm not taking as many students as I used to because of my new role down in the dean's office, but uh, I'm still working with students, so if, if, uh, if it's something that you might be interested in, by all means, feel free to come and talk to me. What are some of the benefits of doing research? Well, uh, publications, you can get your name on a paper, you can get course credit, we have a variety of, of uh, course credit opportunities. Letters of recommendation, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in just a second. Of course, you can also get paid. Some of our faculty pay, their, pay undergraduate students to come and work in their research labs. And so I can point you in those directions if you need a job or something like that. Letter of recommendation really should have been at the top of this list. If you all are in this class and you come to me in a couple of years and you say, I need a letter of recommendation, and really I've just interacted with you in this class, what can I talk about? Well, I can talk about your class participation, right? I can talk about how often you showed up to class. I can talk about your grade, which they already know on the transcript, right? So that's not really adding much information. But beyond that, it's hard to say things, right, unless I really get to know you. And how can I really get to know you? Working with you in a lab, okay? And so whether you work with me or somebody else, keep that in mind. If you're looking for those letters of recommendation that really seal the deal for graduate school and medical school, get involved with things, okay? And research is an excellent one because now all of a sudden that person who's writing that letter of recommendation can talk about your work ethic, they can talk about your problem solving ability for things for which even the professor doesn't know the answer to, <laughs> right? Uh, we can talk about how you, how you worked alongside with graduate students and how you worked alongside with postdoctoral associates, all those kinds of things now. And quite frequently, we can take a letter that may have been a half a page just because you were in my class to now a page and a half of good things, positive things that we can say about you uh, for whatever it is that you're wanting that letter of recommendation for. So I would highly uh, recommend that you think about the letter of recommendation part. Okay, so it's a great way to get a good letter. In my research group, we do a number of things. Uh, obviously all organic chemistry, because I'm an organic chemist. Uh, but we have developed some potential anti-malarial agents. This is a molecule known as uh, glutathione with, with a uh, kind of a twist on it. We've replaced it with a group out here that's not in natural glutathione. Glutathione is a small peptide that is present in each and every one of your cells. Uh, it keeps the oxidative stress in balance uh, in your body. And it turns out that this actually this new glutathione molecule that we've developed actually inhibits the enzyme glutathione reductase. Don't worry about all the graphics here, okay? Uh, but why is that important? It turns out that the parasite that causes malaria is very susceptible to oxidative stress. So when oxidative stress increases, the parasite dies. And so if we can increase oxidative stress within the uh, parasite, we may have a potential anti-malarial. And so it turns out that this glutathione analog we have blocks that enzyme that's, that's responsible for maintaining your oxidative stress balance, okay? Uh, and so we're, we're exploring some things with that uh, these days. Would it cure it or prevent it? Uh, it would cure it, okay? Not, not as a preventative medicine, but a, you would have to have the parasite. What we don't have at the moment is a way to deliver this selectively to the parasite, but it's kind of the first step uh, kind of approach. Uh, we're also working on organocatalysts, that is organic <coughs> molecules that have catalytic uh, ability, and we've worked with some of these amino acids that you see here. Uh, we're working on that a lot these days. Why is it that we might want to be working with organocatalysts? 
Industry needs catalysts to make reactions go faster, right? If you're an industry, time is money, right? Everybody agree with that? Well, if your uh, reactions that you're wanting to do take weeks before you can get the product shipped out to your customer, that's costing you money. We'd like to be able to ship it out within hours or a day or two, right? Improve our productivity. Well, the way that uh, companies do catalysis now, it's largely metal-based catalysts. Things like uh, palladium and platinum and copper and iron and chromium and titanium. What can you tell me about those metals that you know from? They are expensive. What else? Are those things that I could just dump down the river? No. Heavy metals are a contaminant, right? And they, they're toxic, right? Organic molecules are less toxic. Okay? They can be degraded. They can be... Uh, they can be considered more environmentally friendly overall. And so we're trying to transition away from using the transition metals to organic molecules that can actually do the same type of chemistry. There are challenges with that. Metals are very good at catalysis. Organic molecules, not as much. And so there's a lot of room for improvement. But we're trying to add to that as well. So if that's something that interests you, you might want to come by and talk to me. All right, let's talk a little bit about organic chemistry in general, okay? So in chemistry, you probably learned in Gen Chem, right, that chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. And everything is matter that we're interested in, right? Everything from this table to the air that we're breathing to the clothes on your back, right? And the change that it undergoes is actually the chemical processes, okay? There are two main branches in chemistry. Okay, and I say main branches because people, there are subdivisions of this. Okay. There's uh, organic chemistry, which is what you're going to be studying this semester and next, right? Organic was a term that was coined by Berzelius around 1807, so over 200 years ago. At that time, it was thought to be only things that were derived from living things. Okay. Uh, so... If you found a worm and it died, all the matter that it had was considered to be organic. And you all use the term organic a lot, right? Organic gardening, organic foods, organic. And what do you think of when you hear that term? Natural, right? You think natural. And so that's kind of where organic chemistry get, gets its start. And that's why organic chemistry and biochemistry are really two sides of the same coin, okay? But today, it's really the study of carbon-containing compounds, things that have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. To be an organic compound, by definition, you must have a carbon atom that is bound to at least one hydrogen. That's the strict term for organic chemistry. In Gen Chem, you largely learned about inorganic chemistry, right? And this is all the chemistry that occurs from dead stuff, that stuff that was never alive, okay? It's the vast majority of the periodic table. I like to think of inorganic chemistry as rocks, okay? Now, Dr. Wallace would probably scoff at that, but that's okay, all right? From my viewpoint, we've got the living stuff or the stuff that can contribute to a living system, and we got rocks, okay? And they're both important, but it turns out that there are a lot more organic compounds in the universe than there are inorganic compounds, even though there are more elements that we could classify as inorganic. Okay. So I largely consider most of the periodic table as a placeholder for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and the halogens. Okay. In the early days of organic chemistry, there was vitalism. This was the early belief that organic compounds could only be prepared by living things due to some unknown vital force. Okay. And just for your information, my goal here is not to change your religious views at all, okay? But scientifically, this has been disproven. Vitalism does not exist in organic chemistry because we know that we can make organic molecules from things that were inorganic, okay? So, vitalism actually was disproven many, many years ago by Frederick Wohler, who was considered the father of organic chemistry and didn't intend to do this at all. 
didn't set out to disprove the theory of vitalism at all. What he did, okay, was he converted an inorganic compound into an organic one sometime around 1828, okay? He started with ammonium cyanate, which is a rock. It is ammonium OCN, and it is not an organic molecule. It does not exist in a living organism. He placed it into a test tube full of water, and he heated it. And he started to smell a smell similar to ripe urine. Well, where does urine come from? A living thing, right? And it turns out that what happened in that process was he converted this inorganic compound into this thing that was derived from a living substance, urea. Okay? You can't find a rock that has urea in it. Okay? Urea comes from living systems. And so this simple little experiment proved that, in fact, the theory of vitalism was incorrect. Not that there's not a vital force in the universe. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is that the organic molecules can be derived from non-living things. It did not require life for this to happen. If this had just been boiling in a, you know, primordial soup ocean, this would be occurring, okay? And so uh, this experiment was the beginning of modern organic chemistry, okay? Now, ammonium cyanate and urea are isomers of one another, and we're going to talk more about isomers on Friday, okay? But notice that on the left-hand side, our inorganic side, and our organic side, the right-hand side, all have the same number of atoms. Two nitrogens on the left, two nitrogens on the right. Four hydrogens on the left, four hydrogens on the right. A single carbon on the left, a single carbon on the right. An oxygen on the left, an oxygen on the right. But what's different? What's different is how they're connected. And so structure is very, very important to organic chemistry. How things are connected is extraordinarily important, okay? If you connected your proteins together differently, you would die. How they are connected together is so important. It's not just the fact that you have a billion carbon atoms and a 10 billion hydrogen atoms. It's how you connect those things together, okay? And I find that extraordinarily interesting, how you can connect dip things together differently and get different functions out of these things, okay? So let's talk a little bit about structural theory. Okay, there's what ammonium cyanate looks like if we draw the Lewis structure, and there's what urea looks like if we draw the Lewis structure. Just by looking at those, you can clearly tell that things are different, right? Where are all the hydrogens attached to in the ammonium cyanate? A single nitrogen, right? Where are they connected in the urea? The hydrogens. Yeah, the two nitrogens are connected to the carbon now, but where are the hydrogens in the urea? Now they're on two different nitrogens, right? Or on separate nitrogens anyway, right? And now we have carbon-nitrogen bonds, but we didn't have that for, for both nitrogens anyway in the, urea, or in the uh, um, ammonium cyanate, right? So how we connect these things precisely is very, very important, okay? There were three main players in early structural theory, okay? There was Cooper, Butlerov, and Kekulé. And Kekulé is the one that I want to talk about now, okay? Uh, not a particularly handsome fella. At least I don't think so, okay? Uh, but a very important player, okay? Interestingly... He was not a good practical chemist. He was all thumbs in the lab, couldn't do an experiment to save his life. Nor was he an inspiring teacher. Apparently his lectures were so boring people fell asleep a lot. Okay? But he had training in architecture. What does architecture and organic chemistry have in common? Structure. Three dimensions. And so his... Training in architecture turned out to be very, very important. And at the time he began his studies, um, people believed that you couldn't really know the structure of something because when we tried to probe the structure, we changed the structure. When we do reactions, we're really changing the structure of things, right? So how can I know something about structure if what I'm doing to learn something about it is changing it? And Kekulé dismissed that idea. He thought, you know, if, I, if I'm tearing down a... Uh, a <coughs> 
you know, a, a brick house, I know something about the structure when I'm tearing it down. How I'm changing the structure is a reflection of what I started with. But uh, Kekulé, excuse me, uh, talked of a walking or a waking dream, not a walking dream, a waking dream on a London bus where he started to see atoms starting to group themselves in space in three dimensions. And with that waking dream, he postulated a few things. He said carbon can form chains. So carbon can combine with other carbon to form chains. Carbon always had a valency of four, meaning it could form up to four bonds. And the study of reaction products gives structural information. These things turned out to be absolutely correct. And it was all because he fell asleep and had a dream on a London bus. Okay? I wish I could fall backwards into stuff like that. But it doesn't happen easily for all of us. Right? So in the blue bottle experiment that we were just performing, the structure was changing. It is this structure right now. It's the white structure. It's methylene white. When I shake it, what structure is responsible now? Methylene blue. What's different between methylene white and methylene blue? The hydrogens, that's exactly right. Methylene blue is picking up two electrons and two protons from the solution to give methylene white. What is that process? If something is gaining electrons, what's happening? Reduction, right? What's happening when I shake it? I'm getting oxygen into the solution, and I'm going from this state, and I'm oxidizing it back to the blue color. Interestingly enough, the proton and electron source in that bottle is nothing more than sugar, dextrose. Dextrose is a reducing sugar, and that's exactly what it's doing. Okay. Electronic theory became very important here. Electronic theory is the glue that holds structures together. Just like when you build a house, you have to have something that holds everything together, whether it be nails, mortar, right? Electrons are that glue, okay? And so chemical changes can be understood by electronic theory. Reactions occur and atoms move because the electrons are, are moving and, and doing things. Uh, and so reaction mechanisms come from electronic theory. A lot of what you learned in general chemistry really was kind of memorization in a way. You learned that, uh, you know, sodium chloride plus lead nitrate gives lead chloride, which precipitates, right? But did you learn the mechanism for how that happens? No. How is it that this atom and that atom come together to form that precipitate? We're going to learn that in this class, not with that particular reaction. But how is it that methane, natural gas, burns to give carbon dioxide and water? We'll learn things like that, how it actually happens, as opposed to just memorization of, of the fact that it does happen. And it turns out that there are usually a sequence of events, even for the simplest of reactions, where A simply converts to B. Okay? Let's talk a little bit about the influence of organic chemistry. What time do we have? Oh, we're a little late, aren't we? All right. I'm going to stop that there, and I'm sorry.